Well, welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Devani. Um, my very special guest is Connery Brown. He's from the States. And I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Connery, but I'm, I've been following you for, uh, for some quite time. And um, I read your article. Uh, I got it right here. If I may just show it for the listeners and viewers. Uh, there it is. That's your Twitter page. Uh, that is Bitcoin has no intrinsic value and that's great. And uh, I don't know anybody who's read the article and said, you know, it's it's like, you know, everybody was like totally excited about this article because it really shatters every myth and, and fallacies of thinking when it comes to this, you know, pseudo argumentation with a something, you know, uh, money sh uh, such as Bitcoin, you know, should have or, or uh, does have or should have, you know, uh, intrinsic value. So thank you so much for your time and coming to my show. Uh, and why don't you just introduce yourself? How did you, you get to Bitcoin? A little bit about your background, because I, I think you are at Stanford Law University. As far yeah, as that's I, correct. Yeah. yeah. So, go ahead. Thank you so much. Yeah, so thank you so much for having me on. Uh, it's really a pleasure. And I, I love talking to Bitcoiners whenever I can. So my name is Connor Brown. I'm a Stanford Law student right now. Uh, I'm currently halfway through. And, um, you know, I came expecting to study law and I ended up studying Bitcoin and it was really an accidental rabbit hole. I found myself stumbling down, um, but it's been fantastic because it's given me a lot of free time to just study whatever I want, really. And uh, the way the, the law curriculum works is, you know, by the end of the, your first year, you basically have your job lined up. <clears throat> so now I have about two years to just kind of do whatever I want. And so I've just been learning about Bitcoin as much as I can. And it has really just changed how I view the world. And I'm sure we'll get into that later. But um, yeah, the article was written um, just because it was so frustrating hearing people harp on this idea of intrinsic value um, over and over, especially like the mainstream media type stuff. So I wanted to, you know, make something that was really polished and really to the point. I didn't want it very long and just like a quick thing to send someone um, you know, if someone is making that argument, but they don't really know what they're talking about and you can just boom, send it to them. Great. Great. Um, now you got, um, you know, you, you, you touched upon it, uh, which, which, uh, which leads me then, you know, to my, to my, you know, original purpose and intention for this interview talking with you, or, or it's part of sort of a special series of episodes, which I'm doing with a lot of Bitcoiners in the Bitcoin community who have profound knowledge in some kind of area, would it be, you know, whatever it is, Austrian economics or, or law or, or, or technology. And uh, by the way, your article is on medium.com for the uh, listeners and viewers, for the folks who want to, you know, read it for themselves, uh, slash at uh, Connor G. Brown. I'm going to put all this info into the video description and podcast description. Um, and let me see where I can find it. It's right there. Yeah, this is where you say gold is another example. Um, with Bitcoin, we can actually afford to go to the moon. <laughs> and you meant it in a literal sense, like with technology. What did you mean by that? Because that would lead me to my core question. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think that really highlights one of the, the key points of the article, which is, you know, the idea that we've had these previous stores of value that double as commodities is not actually a benefit, but it's actually a detriment to us as society. Um, by having Bitcoin be a digital store of value, then when we are transferring our wealth from things that previously had uses as commodities, such as gold, right? And when, when we have them locked up in a vault, we're not using them for anything. We're choosing them for their monetary purposes instead of for their commodity purposes. So when we shift from a store of value in uh, something that also doubles as a commodity to just something pure like Bitcoin, we can unlock that you know, stored value or, or however you want to phrase it, right? It's intrinsic commodity uses. Um, and, you know, as that sell off occurs, gold becomes much cheaper. You know, right now the silver market cap is like, I want to say 14 or 15 billion, right? And so, you know, you can see how far gold has potential to fall and it frees up, it makes those resources cheaper because they're not constantly being bid up by their monetary purposes. And uh, yeah, it, could afford much greater advances in, in types of technology that are suddenly affordable. Um, gold is very useful in computer chips, medical technologies, aerospace technology, all of those sorts of things could be much cheaper 
um, if we stopped holding gold for its store value purpose and used it as a commodity. Great. Great. Now, um, you've read probably the, the, um, uh, the book, this uh, you know, uh, fantastic book by Safira Namuz, The Bitcoin Standard, subtitled yes. The Decentralized Alternative yes. to Central Banking. And I found, you know, uh, uh, there's a few chapters which I really find for myself uh, really goes to the core of, um, because every, each one of us, you know, has different, unique, uh, what should I say, intentions, uh, desires, motivations, wishes, uh, or philosophies behind Bitcoin. Mm. But in the core essence, it's pretty much the same. I mean, we want, you know, a more uh, a sound money system uh, with a sound, uh, and there's, a, there's an architecture to Bitcoin, right? There's an essence, there are features, unique features to Bitcoin, which we probably would never have ever found in human history. And that's why, you know, it is called a scarce as hard as money, uh, I would say, right, in uh, ever created yeah. human history. Now, what I want to know is your thoughts, your perspectives, your, your you know, your thought process. Uh, because on page 97, um, if I may just read that, because it's otherwise people are not going to know what I'm talking about here. Um, of Safed and uh, Amuz, uh, the Bitcoin standard, it says here, those of us who are enamored with the concept of progress find, find it hard to swallow the fact that the world of sound money pre-1914, that was where the decoupling of the gold was right happening, right. was the world of zero to one. Uh, the zero to one is reference sort of uh, to uh, Peter Thiel's book, uh, Zero to One, sort of the original really, uh, let's just call it evolutionary innovations in the 19th century under the gold standard, under hard money uh, versus the 20th century, the easy money when it was, you know, central banking for the listeners and viewers, uh, the central banking, fiat money, inflationary money. So um, where's the post? Post, uh, so after 1914, world of government produced money is the world of moving from one to many. So there's nothing wrong with the move from one to many, but it certainly gives us plenty of food for thought to consider why we do not have many more zero to one transformations under our modern monetary system. And then it goes on, just the last sentence, the majority of the technology we use in our modern life was invented in the 19th century under the gold standard, financed with the ever-growing stock of capital accumulated by savers, storing their wealth in a sound money and store of value which did not depreciate quickly. And then he gives a summary of all, you know, of some of the most important innovations of the period provided. And I find it really interesting and fascinating. I have thought, do people, because, I mean, we are not in the mainstream yet. We are not in the mainstream adoption yet. But this is my, uh, to be honest, my very own dream and vision and wish and desire to accelerate the process of mass adoption. <laughs> but before mass adoption, I'm, I'm asking myself, I'm asking you, what would you say is the process to mass education, to comprehension, and then to mass adoption? Because, uh, I mean, in the, at the end of the day, yes, we cannot eat, we cannot taste Bitcoin, but we can create something out of it. So I'm thinking, God, if gold is hard money and Bitcoin is the hardest money ever created in human history, and then in the essence, it's totally decentralized, totally open, borderless, censorship resistant, neutral. I mean, all these features, you know, Andreas Antonopoulos talks about, and we are all, you know, talking about Bitcoin community. Where do you see this process going? Or as Austrian economist Hoppe said, the process of civilization. I think that you just asked so many profound questions. Sorry um, about that. <laughs> and I, I, I'm like kind of taking notes over here and I have a few different ones I want to touch on. Um, the first thing I want to start with is the idea that the gold standard left in 1914. And that's really important because, you know, that was right in World War I. World War I was financed by the destruction of the gold standard, essentially. Um, and, you know, since then, we've seen just unparalleled military force being exerted all across the world. Um, the, the 20th century was really the most violent century we've ever had. And I think that fiat money really helps that it enables this sort of war fighting that wasn't possible 
um, because suddenly you have a new method of extracting wealth from your citizens. Instead of honest taxation, you can you know, tax them without them actually knowing it. The numbers in their bank account don't change, but they're losing their money every day. And you can finance um, militaries that just weren't previously possible. And you, know, you can see that in World War I, where World War I was the first time that you had wars just drag on for so long. Um, and that was possible because they suspended the gold standard, they issued fiat currencies, and they just instituted hyperinflation. Um, on both the war front, things were terrible for years. On the home front, people were starving um, and people's wealth just disappeared. And it really ruined Europe for a long time and then set up, you know, uh, the German crisis, which was also spurred by hyperinflation and also allowed for unprecedented military um, advancements. So, you know, I think that one thing that I'm very hopeful about is that Bitcoin brings a more peaceful world that um you know the only way these massive military budgets are able to be sustained right now is through inflationary spending through massive debt spending um and i i don't see that being sustainable in a world with bitcoin where you have that that strong base and the people are able to hold their wealth for themselves so that's something that i think is really exciting um the next thing that you mentioned is the idea of, you know, what does our society look like when it's organized in a way where we have a sound money, where people, where saving is encouraged. And I think that um, the, the way that people learn and they prepare themselves for jobs is going to radically change. Um, the analogy I use is that money is similar to a language and that any language has certain philosophical com concepts embedded into it. You know, some languages don't even have a concept of I, they just have a concept of we, you know, like any, any language you're speaking has certain philosophical bases, you know, some languages only have certain colors and then those people can only see those certain colors. In the same way, money is a language itself. Money is a way of communicating value between individuals in the same way that language is a way of communicating, you know, subjective states. And we know value is subjective as well. So, because money is similar to a language, I think that money has its own philosophical assumptions baked in as well. That when you have a sound money, you're philosophically oriented towards saving. Whereas when you have a weak money, a fiat money, you're philosophically oriented to spending through, uh, you know, now is better than the future um, type ideologies. And I think that is extremely evident in our education system, where because we have the ability for massively cheap loans and things like that, you know, through this, this fiat process, you know, you can see the student loan bubble. It's like massive right now. I don't even know the numbers, like a trillion dollars or something in America. Um, and, you know, around that we have economies that have kind of baked up exactly what you would expect. If our money is one that forces us to kind of speak cheap debt, then you have entire industries built around cheap debt. You know, in America, the law school system is outrageous, really, because there's only a few really good law schools, and then there's like, you know, 70% of them that are not good at all, but they cost just as much, and people go to them every year because they can get those cheap loans guaranteed by the government. And so you have entire economies built around cheap debt, and what it does is it shackles people, um, and they make decisions not based on you know accurate credit representations but just based on fiat representations and it leads to people becoming extremely risk averse you know you might be willing to make a company and try to make that zero to one great technological innovation that peter Thiel talks about if you don't go to college if you don't have you know student debt that is due at the end of the month um, and that's actually what Peter Thiel's doing. He's like, you know, put out scholarships to try to get people to not go to college. Um, but when almost all of our smartest kids um, in America come out with massive student debt, they have to play safe. They have to kind of play the game at the moment in your life when you're supposed to be, you know, super sharp, a risk taker, willing to go out and break things. Instead, you have to go get a job at Facebook because that's what's going to pay your student loan bills. 
um, because you can't afford to be risky because you're saddled with this fiat um, holding you down in a way. So I think that's that's a really good thing. Um, And then the last thing you mentioned was this idea of mass adoption and, you know, what gets us to mass adoption. And I think this is a really, it's a difficult question because, you know, I don't think it will be an optimistic case that gets us there. I think it will be through tragic necessity that that gets us there. I don't think it's going to be through speculation, unfortunately. I think some of us will see it, you know, see what's on the horizon, but I think that it will take a situation like Venezuela. I think things are going to have to get bad. Um, I think people will have to come to reality about fiat failing them in a catastrophic way um, before it becomes really obvious that Bitcoin is needed as a universal store of value and medium of exchange. So, yeah, that was a lot, but those are kind of all the thoughts that came to mind after your question. No, fantastic. No, listen, I mean... um... I, I, I do see parallel strategies f- for for this process of mass adoption. As you said, it's the mm-hmm. pain points. Uh, I call it yeah. pain points. People, if you go right, if you go to Venezuela, you don't need to explain much to them. They just do yeah. it, right? They just say, just just let me know how I ca- how can I transfer my whatever my 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 last savings over the borders. So people in the Western or I'm like in Austria, they don't feel the pain points. We're, you know, pretty spoiled brats, right? I mean, we have all the luxury actually that we need, you know, for survival, for, for comfort. We have the comfort. We are too comfortable. Um, so we don't feel it yet. I mean, let alone, we're not even talking about inflation, real inflation, or hyperinflation, or some kind of real recessions or, or just you know, not, not even mentioning crashes. So, yeah. What do you think is that, would, do you think that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go because I had, a, I had a side question to that, what, what technological innovations are concerned. But do you see that, I mean, the more, you know, the system or whatever, whatever the entities are going to speed up this process of, you know, of self-destruction you know, quantitative easing, pumping yeah. trillions into the stock market, all these really Keynesianism uh, of insanity that's been going on. It's good. Maybe it's good that they're doing it because they're actually doing us or the, you know, the Bitcoin, uh, it's doing Bitcoin a, a favor, actually. And the other thing is, okay, for the people who, you know, like in Western developed nations, uh, maybe we need a little bit more comprehension what it means to live, to have a, I call it the monetary root layer of Bitcoin. What does it mean for the individual, for the average person, for our, for us as a society? What kind of decentralization processes are going to evolve? And that leads me to that question again, uh, to my original question, because that, that's the one and only single sentence I don't agree with Safeda Namus. He says, mm. um, the majority of the technology we use in our modern life was invented in the 19th century under the gold standard, financed with the ever-growing stock of capital accumulated by savers storing their wealth. And then somewhere he says, in the 20th century, um, we just had sort of a more of, a, what do you call it, uh, optimization, uh, you know, uh, further development of old technologies. Well, I don't agree with that because these really super innovative advanced technologies they are here either they are being have been suppressed i mean how many t- thousands of patents have been confiscated in the name of national security how many yeah. scientists inventors engineers you know i don't want to go too too deep now this is going to go to you know beyond the scope of this interview but uh you know how many people have been they just say silenced or you know suppressed um but because of the corporate military industrial complex or whatever we want to call it, uh, central mm-hmm. bank controlled and everything. So the technology in the root is there, but it's not accessible for us. Yeah. Um, the, the question, my question, I think my core question is once Bitcoin reaches the critical mass of mass adoption, we have a monetary sound, which is, can never be, it's not confiscatable. It's not, you know, it is unstoppable. It is, it is, it's done. The job is done. What happens to all these structures? Like, you know, you talked about entrepreneurs, you talked about the students. Yes. So we're going to free up the money that like the monetary value. Uh, 
what other structures do you see evolving? Because at the end of the day, what kind of vision, what kind of future do we want with this monetary root layer of Bitcoin? Wow, so many good questions there, and I'm taking more notes, and I'm kind of <laughs> writing down what I want to say. Um, so the, I, the first thing you're talking about is, you know, are these people doing us a favor? Are these central bankers pumping the stock market full of trillions doing us a favor? Absolutely. Um, well, in a way, you know, what they're doing is inevitable. They have put themselves on this road to, you know, ever decreasing interest rates, and you know, once they start playing with the levers of money you know, that really fundamental base of how all the signs and symbols of the economy are organized, then, you know, it's that road to serfdom that Hayek talks about. This idea that once you mess it up, then you have to mess it up further to stop that temporary problem. I mean, it, it's this, this, this terrible um, feedback loop. So in a way, they are, in a way, what we're doing is doing them a favor, right? They've started down this path. And, you know, I was talking to Dan Held about this. Uh, I love Dan. And he was telling me about the science fiction book where, you know, this, I, I can't remember the plot exactly, but the gist of it is um, they realize that the galaxy is inevitably going to go into a dark age. And that this is something that has happened, you know, as far back as history goes. Yeah, in the natural is, cycle. In the future. <laughs> right. And... They realize it's going to happen and they realize they can't stop it. But what they can do is they can shorten it. Yeah. And I think that, you know, our purpose is somewhere similar to that. We find our, we find ourselves in a world where the cycle is already happened. The dark age is going to come. Um, what we can do is, you know, Bitcoin has provided this alternative that when that dark age happens and, you know, who knows when it's going to be. I mean, I'm terrified every time I look at the stock market. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> and you can't really know because it goes back to that Austrian idea of when the fundamental base of money is distorted, you have second layer distortions all throughout. And so when we have interest rates artificially low, you have malinvestment and that is difficult to see. And you, you know, when you're messing with the levers, you're technically giving out loans that shouldn't be given out, but to everyone to the naked eye, they appear like they should be given out, you know, because that's the rate you've set for them to be okay with. And so you have massively unprofitable ventures, you know, tons of capital being wasted um, because, you know, they could either finance a buyback or they could, you know, finance another round of venture capital. I mean, you can look at what Uber and Lyft are doing and these, you know, massively valued, um, private companies go public and their values like cut in half. I mean, it's really shocking to see, but it, it's not that surprising from an Austrian perspective because this is just a classic example of malinvestment and, and misallocation of capital. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an inevitable path they find themselves on and I, I don't know where it will end up, but I think that 2008 was largely just the beginning. Um, and I think, you know, like I said earlier, people are not going to be driven to Bitcoin out of optimism and speculation. It'll be out of tragic necessity. And I think that something will happen in the equity markets and, you know, broader global markets to kind of make that painfully obvious. Um, and we'll see, you know, who knows if it's Trump, like at, at this point, I think that Trump almost knows that it's going to happen eventually. And he is terrified that it happens before he gets reelected. Um, and so now he's pressuring the Fed to just keep things high as long as they can through more quantitative easing and things like that. It's, it's really a bizarre time, but I think it's late stages. Um, and then the, the other half of your question was about what happens with decentralization and new advances and what does the life look like for the individual? And I think that, you know, it's a cliche almost in the Bitcoin community, but the sovereign individual is a very informative book about what the future looks like in my mind just because even the idea of um of nation states are being called into question the very concept of having a country and having borders um is beginning to seem laughable in a way and and the internet was really the first great step in that direction um and the idea that we can 
share ideas between borders without any sort of you know fencing it's it's really amazing and moving towards a sort of universal human identity that goes beyond that i think that's a really important and beautiful thing and i think that having a ability to communicate value and not only just communicate information is you know the natural next step in that process towards a sovereign individual landscape i think that governments are inevitable and a good thing in a way um you know for capitalism and for human flourishing because you do need some sort of system that um you need a system to resolve subjective disputes you know contract law is extremely important and you know an anarchic system would need some way of resolving these subjective disputes that come up between individuals when they sign a contract and they both expect performance and you know the terms get confused because language is inherently confusing human interaction and communication is inherently confusing and there will be um inevitable disputes so you need some sort of resolution system i think that as we move towards this more sovereign individual world um it it might not be governments doing that resolution i think it could be private companies um at least i think that we could have governments as basically this is something i i've been thinking about a little bit but essentially as governments i think lose power as you know they're one of the most essential things for them which has been um their ability to control money once that is taken from them yeah. and we kind of move to a place where governments are weakened um i can see the governments being used for some sort of you know international dispute resolution but courts are very expensive they're very slow um the entire process at the nation state level is just very difficult there's lots of friction um I can see that moving more towards basically that's like layer 1, right? And that's for resolving major disputes. And then you have layer 2 which is like uh resolving disputes through an international company or or multinational company or something like that. And so, you know, you can already start to see this with like Bank of America's chargeback program, you know, stuff like that where like you know, these different banks, you call them you say you didn't actually want to pay for this you you know you bought a couch and it was the wrong color red and you know they have to the person on the line has to decide whether or not they want to give you your money back through your credit card transaction i think we could see similar things where um uh, and and that's really they're acting as a form of a court you know they're acting as some sort of arbiter of subjective truth i think that that could be even more um common I think Twitter is an example of something that we could see you know people are calling a lot into question about Twitter's governance mm-hmm. and the way it resolves those disputes. I could see something similar happening or I I could see that strengthening in the future where Twitter plays an important role um or companies like it in resolving disputes that would traditionally be settled by nation states and you know for a really big expensive dispute between massive companies maybe you go and settle back to the layer 1 for everyday ordinary disputes you settle it between you know your credit providers or your your uh, speech platform providers you know i mean it could get could get really strange but i think it ultimately moves towards a more fluid liquid world uh where the cost of transportation increasingly goes down the cost of communicating across borders increasingly goes down and ultimately you know i'm i'm super optimistic i think it's going to be dark before it gets light but i do think that we move towards uh a new renaissance age in a way um where these these borders and these restrictions sort to sort of fade away and i think that it's it's really exciting a really really exciting time just to be alive and to be on the cusp of whatever major transition is about to happen great um the well the my question i think is also um okay people i guess people uh, you know they need to educate themselves that money as like bitcoin is first a store of value 
than mm -hmm. medium exchange unit of account. Do you think it's possible to accelerate that, that understanding process for people? Because I'm, I'm like, okay, if, if that could be like our, let's say, you know, collective um, challenge or vision within the Bitcoin community to, the, to, to make people understand, you know, don't, you know, I always tell people don't don't consider Bitcoin or Satoshi's as a as a medium of exchange yet as a classical, you know, uh, mainstream day to day um, transactional value thing that you want to pay your coffee for. But it's you already can, right? It's it's already possible, and the technology for that is already evolving at an incredibly rate of speed, which is unimaginable. I mean, just look at Blockstream now, independence of independently of the internet. The, the prevention of splitting of internet connection. I mean, the, all these things, it's just amazing. And I'm like, okay, what if the, the challenge could be, uh, and it's a realistic challenge that up to the year 2024, where then the, 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 the sort of the halving after the next halving <laughs> gonna mm -hmm. happen to whatever 3.25 uh, uh, something, um, that people start uh, at least half of the Earth's population. Uh, you tell me whether that's realistic or not, but the year two, 20, uh, 2024, that three to four billion people have at least a handful of Satoshis just on some kind of wallet. That's the ultimate thing I'm wishing for, just as a store of value. Then we'll see. Yeah, no, I, I think you're asking a lot of really important questions. I think that... Uh, the last thing you're talking about, this idea of billions of people having it and how fast we can see that happening. It's a really difficult question. I mean, some Bitcoiners say this is going to take 100 years. And I think that they're crazy just because, you know, I mean, the internet, what? I mean, it's like 20 something years old. I mean, when it really started to kick off where about Bitcoin is now, I think it's taken about 20 years. Uh, or sorry, the internet about 20 years to really just cover, you know, even the most forested parts of the Amazon jungle. I mean, it's really been amazing. And think about the internet was kicked off without any of these rails being in place. You know, the internet had to build all that infrastructure on the ground to get that to work. But now with Bitcoin, we're seeing a similar exponential technology that can have the exact same network effects but we don't need to build the infrastructure. And if some sort of global event occurs, if something crazy does happen in terms of the dollar being questioned, I mean, imagine how crazy that would be if, if the global unit of account largely just, some, if something really strange happened and you know it started to quickly lose its value, you could imagine a flight to you know, Bitcoin happening in just a few years. Yeah. And because those, those rails are already built out. And I think that's really the big distinction is we've never seen an exponential technology with these network effects, these incre like network effects we've never even seen before. Because it's not only like you use it because your friends are using it, but you literally get paid to use it. And so incredible, incredible network effects with global rails already. I mean, it could happen so fast. Uh, I think people really underestimate that. Uh, the other thing you were mentioning is the idea of money as a store of value, distinct from it as a medium of exchange. And I think that you've touched on something really important here, which is that money evolves. Money is not something that just comes into the world and it suddenly is a store of value, medium of exchange, and unit of account simultaneously. Mm -hmm. That's silly, right? What it is, is it is something that goes through a natural evolution process. You know, first it has to become a store of value. You know, it has to kind of suck up all this value and get a really strong, massive, liquid base. And then on that base, then it can be a medium of exchange. And then as it's used as a medium of exchange, it will become accepted as a unit of account. And that is a very different thing than, you know, you traditionally would hear, I guess. You know, when I was talking to... Um, Hold on, I'm trying to think of his name. I think his name is Kevin. Um, anyways, I was talking to, is that his name, Kevin? Yes, Kevin Warsh. 
He was the governor of the Federal Reserve under Ben Bernanke. He came and gave a speech here at Stanford, okay. and I asked him about Bitcoin. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, of course. And he was like, oh, it's never going to work. It's too volatile. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Okay, Kevin. Um, but, you know, his point was, and I kept badgering him a little bit, and his point was that, you know, it might be a store of value, but it'll never be a medium of exchange because it's too volatile. And that it has to be, um, in, his, his, in his view, a money had to be all three at the same time. And I said, don't you think it's a little bit strange to imagine all of them happening at the same time? You know, like, it's not like, you know, some super being is going to just drop down a money that does all three. Um, you only become a medium of exchange through a socialization process because many people have stored their time in it. And if people haven't already stored their time in it, then you wouldn't use it as a medium of exchange unless there's some extreme circumstances. And I think we see that with like the Silk Road, you know, where the only way to get drugs was to use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. And I think that was important for Bitcoin to grow and to kind of see that potential for its future. But largely, you know, you never want to trade something as a medium of exchange until it's a store of value, because if it's still in its store of value phase, you're losing money. Like I'm not spending. It's a guy, right? Oh my god, he hates himself, right? Um, so guilty. The poor guy. I, I feel terrible for the guy, poor Laszlo. And then you're know, 60 minutes making. It's such a cynical, sarcastic. I don't know. It's so stupid. <laughs> I think you know. I mean, who cares? He did, you know, the world a favor. You know. No, he did. He he certainly did. And I hope that he got at least a pretty good stash of Bitcoin off. Yeah. Of that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, but, that's a good question. How much did he have left? I mean, uh, did he have like, what, 100,000? Or did he have really just 10,000? He said, you know, what the heck with it? You know, I'm going to spend it. So. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's it's a really weird thing. I mean, who knows? Who knows? Um, but the the idea of money evolving is something that, you know, mainstream economics can't really grapple with because they never even think that deeply about money in the first place. Um, but yeah, I, I do see it being this exponential technology that does seed itself as a unit of value. I mean, a decade seems like a very long period of time, in my opinion. Um, so I could see it happening way before then. Yeah. Uh, on the flip side, though, I do think that um, money is something that is unique in that people need time to trust it. And I think that this gets to another thing about Bitcoin that um, is a difficulty with Bitcoin that can be overcome. But, you know, with any technology, if I turn on my television, you know, if I talk into this microphone, I know it works. I can look at it and, you know, you can tell me, oh, that television shows you images of, you know, some event. And then I turn it on and it works. And I can see with my own eyes that it's really working. With Bitcoin, you can't do that. Yeah. You can't really show someone there's only 21 million Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You have to really trust in a way uh, if you're going to put your money into it, unless you really want to take the time to learn and get really technical. But it does not work in the way that any other technology works that you can just use it and see it work. But don't you find it a little bit schizophrenic, the whole thing? Because Bitcoin is about, or Satoshi Nakamoto's vision was about trustlessness. He talks yes. about, you know, the yes. trust the third party, the trusted intermediary. Now we got to trust into the trustlessness of, yes. of cryptography and mathematics or whatever you want to call it. I don't know what you want to call it, right? I mean, the technology behind it. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a difficulty. And that's that is something that, I mean, it's a hurdle as a technology, but it's not something that, um, it, it just slows adoption. I don't think it hurts adoption anyway. It's just something that, um, causes people to, you know, like, it just causes them to pause because they can't see it. They have to learn. And the, the the step to learning about a technology and how it works, I don't even know how my TV works. I, I, I have no idea. I use it. Yeah, I've used it for years. I don't know how the thing works. Um, Bitcoin's like the first thing I understand. I don't know how my computer works. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, that's a difficulty. And I think that slows down adoption because people are so terrified of putting their money in something that's scary. Um, but I do think as the narrative against fiat changes, then people will trust it more in a sense because they know they're losing with yeah. fiat. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's and, and I think that as the, the marketplace develops and more respectable 
companies like Microsoft and Square get involved, I think that's another thing that gives it an air of legitimacy yeah. that it previously didn't have and can accelerate that network effect process. Yeah, and that mainstream, I think this echo or this whatever halo effect of the mainstream adoption is like something super important, I think, for people. It's like, oh, this institution, they, so it must be something about it, right? Um, I don't, yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, people don't really educate themselves, whatever the mainstream media or the institutional politicians or, you know, uh, uh, stupid Nobel Prize winners say <laughs> they've got it all wrong you know, on, on every end you can think of with a, whatever technology we're talking about. It was was always, you know, dumb, you know, some, somehow, tr you know, being discredited or was it the Internet or the computer or the, you know, the fax machine? It's just uh, it's incredible. So. Sometimes I'm thinking, you know, I wish we would stop talking about Bitcoin, but just being on that monetary root layer. It's like I'm maybe I'm too fast forwarding in my in my brain, uh, and and I'm thinking, what is the root problem of of this transfer of communication of education of knowledge? Is it because really it's people? First of all, they don't have the time time is scarce, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have the time, they don't have the energy, they don't have, the, you know, for people working eight to 12 hours a day, uh, where are they gonna take the time, you know, the energy and the passion to educate like me? I mean, I've gone, you know, every, each one of us has gone whatever through shit coinery, not no coinery, then, you know, down the path through the rabbit hole to the Bitcoin, to the wow effect, you know? So I'm like, what, what, what is needed, what is required to translate that knowledge? I mean, how far do we have to break down this language? Do we have to visualize it? Maybe we should visualize it. I mean, you know, look at the commercials, TV commercials of Tesla. <laughs> you look at the TV uh. commercial of Tesla, they're like, in three minutes, they give you like the vision, the emotions, and the understanding what this technology is about. I love it. And I'm like, maybe this, maybe people are, we are already so brainwashed, so dumbed down that maybe humanity masses of the people needs you know another form another shape of i don't know uh, translation you know what i'm getting at I, I know exactly what you mean and i think that you've touched on something huge which is time you know like it is a really difficult thing because bitcoin requires you know it touches on so many different aspects of the world i mean it's not just technology it's economics it's history it's monetary theory it's it is a lot to digest it's not something you can just get in a few minutes and so it, it naturally is working against someone in the sense that to really appreciate it and become, you know, a full Bitcoiner like we are, you know, it takes a lot of time and people don't have time. But more than that, they don't even know they need to spend the time. You know, it's one of those things like they don't understand how important it is. And so they don't, they're not willing to take the time to learn about it because they don't even, they can't even appreciate what's on the other side. And that's a difficult thing, you yeah. know, because to spend the time, you have to know that you're investing it for a good purpose. And they don't even know that because they haven't learned about it. It's a, it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem. Um, and I think that's why everyone comes to Bitcoin through pretty weird ways, just because, um, you know, for example, I came to Bitcoin because I wanted to pursue a writing career um, while I was like working at, as a law student. And I was like, oh, I, I need something to write about. And I don't really know anything, so I'm going to start writing about blockchain, blockchain, you know, because <laughs> uh, because I'm at Stanford and that's like a cool thing that everyone's talking about. And then I was like, holy shit, Bitcoin is amazing, right? But, you know, I didn't even think about what the potential was there. I was trying to do something completely, you know, secondary to the entire Bitcoin um, ideology and it just kind of struck me. And I think that this is magnified by the fact that money is something that people don't think about. You know, it's half of every transaction you've ever enter, entered into and you never actually question money itself. Yeah. Whew. And I, and I think that that's so bizarre. People really believe that money is subjective and sort of arbitrary. And I think that money is not subjective at all. Um, but when people think that it's subjective, it, it becomes like, you know, it's there, but they don't see it. It's a, it's a hard thing to explain. Like, I never questioned money before I saw Bitcoin. Yeah. I never really thought about it. I just, you know. Um, and I think this is actually where a lot of, um, like, 
so, like social critics and philosophers that are more on like the communist side of things. I think that's where they go wrong because they're actually critiquing fiat and they don't know it. And they end up thinking it's a problem of capitalism. And the reality is they're not critiquing capitalism. They're critiquing fiat money that creates a lot of social problems that, and because money is associated with capitalism and they're sort of blended to the whole thing because money is largely invisible as an ideology that people get tricked that way. Even the smartest theorists and academic minds fall for conflating fiat money with capitalism. And I th think that a lot of people have gone wrong in that way. So it, it, it is really difficult. Um, maybe a good advertising campaign or something like that. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. is that going to do it? I, I think the best campaign is Venezuela, you know, and, yeah. and that goes back to what we were saying earlier that the true advertising campaign is going to be when things get scary. Yeah. Um, Such as Bailey in, in Cyprus, you know, I mean, if these things like happen on a massive scale, <laughs> then people know, okay, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to withdraw, you know, any money, but the money is going to be worthless or, you know, it's just locked up. So what are you going to do? Right. And uh, then they're uh, gonna, I understand the borderlessness, or whatever the censorship resistance stuff. Right. Exactly. And I think that a lot of people, you know, in 2008 planted a lot of seeds in a way. Yeah. And whether it be on the left with a distrust of large banks and corporations or on the right with a distrust of large government, you know, 2008 was largely a crisis of trust. And, you know, in many ways, it's kind of due on both sides because they're really working together. I mean, it was crony capitalism at play that was large corporations and large government getting together and privatizing gains and publicizing losses. Um, so I think that that seed has already been planted. I think that um, if it happens again, then there's a strong chance that the narrative can shift to not critiquing capitalism, but critiquing a system of money, um, which at its core enables those sorts of excesses. And I, so I think that it's really good that Bitcoin is there now um, as sort of a um, a release valve, you know, somewhere else that they can put their anger towards that explains why things have been happening in a very elegant way and, you know, gives them a way they can opt out and they can peacefully, you know, it's not about voting, it's not about doing anything violent, it's just buying Bitcoin. That's all it takes to slowly create change. Um, there's actually, I think, a lot of similarities between what happened or what, what Bitcoin stands for and what people across the world, you, you know, kind of universally see as the calling for from so many revolutions, like even the American Revolution, the idea that Americans should not be controlled by a small group of people in a foreign country that are really just helping themselves, you know, that Americans need to stand up for their own colonies and for their own representation. I mean, that's really what Bitcoin's about too, that we don't need the small FOMC making decisions for us, right? When really they're just lining their own pockets and their friends, or, you know, whatever it might be. And instead we need to have something that we can all buy into, that we can share as this universal, um, you know, system that we can kind of, feel that it, we're being fairly represented in through its decentralized nature. So I think that it is hard to educate, but when the time is right, we almost won't have to. Yeah. 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 You know, this chain reaction of events, it's going to happen. I mean, I'm really up for any kind of surprises now because there's so many things right now, dynamic processes taking place. Uh, I mean, what do you think about, you know, nations? It could be, you know, what if one or two nations is really seriously adopt Bitcoin as a settlement layer, whatever we want to call it, like final settlement layer or something like that. Would it be Iran or something? Would they even now, the officials of Iran are saying, uh, we cannot stop Bitcoin. I mean, that's a huge let's, statement. Yeah, well, yeah, you can't control it. Yeah, you cannot confiscate. You cannot stop it. What are you going to do about it? And people are mining because the electricity is super cheap in Iran. It's like... It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the state controlled. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, 
I mean, I, I think that could be huge. It's it's a really interesting thought experiment because everyone has the incentive to do it in a way, you know, like you could imagine even something like, like a country like Japan, you know, if they're smart about it, they would know that if they took, you know, 10% of their cash on hand and put it into Bitcoin, right? And they built a position over time of maybe, I don't know, 500,000 Bitcoin or something. And they announced it publicly. Ooh, they would automatically like quadruple yeah. their initial investment just by announcing it. And yeah. so you can imagine, you know, everyone if if they're thinking about it right, um, the incentives at play for countries doing this are just crazy. And so, you know, it's just natural that someone is going to make that play first. And I think then it becomes a dangerous thing. You know, no country. Let's let's say China or Japan does something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone else might be thinking it's probably not going to happen, but you know they also know there's a chance yeah. the hyper Bitcoinization happens, and so they have to buy a little bit because they don't want to be the country that had nothing. I mean, I think that the Bitcoin standard is great when it's articulating what happened um, to India and China when they held their store of value in silver. And silver was largely demonetized in favor of gold and paper currencies. I mean, they held the short end of the stick. They they lost like half of their nation's wealth overnight um, because they were holding the weaker, you know, uh, softer currency. And so yeah. you could imagine governments around the world, they're not stupid. They know this could happen and they don't want to be sitting there holding the short end of the stick. And so they have to buy in a little bit. And then it just gets that whole network effect going where the price skyrockets. I mean, it could get so crazy so fast. Yeah. And then and the it's fact- really fast, I think, you know, because then <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's like a, a super chain reaction of events and, 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 and you know, interactions. Uh, it's just unstoppable, right? It's, it's unbelievable because, it's, you know, I, I see so many charts that are like a log, you know, uh-huh. and they kind of start like exponentially upwards and then they kind of trail off when they're macking Bitcoin. But I think it's really more of like an S shape, you know, yeah. that like we're this. right now, we're, yeah. we're in the vertical. S. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're like halfway, but then it, it, it goes right back up vertical at the yeah. end as well. Yeah. Because it is this exponential technology and it becomes this thing that, it, it's like this poison pill that the governments can't resist taking because they can't, they can't be, they can't miss out on it. But at the same time, like by buying it, each of them individually ends up creating the ruin of all of them. It's a really crazy concept yeah um but it's it's exciting yeah. and it, and it's purely rational that's yeah. the craziest part is that it's so rational for every actor and um, if just if just humanity i would just wish humanity would just understand that one principle it's absolutely and totally limited in supply. It's it's totally <laughs> scarce. It's the scarcest money. I mean, how many satoshis are there? Two quadrillion or something like that. One bitcoin is one hundred million satoshis. So twenty one million. And even if there are, and and you know, uh, how many people are saying or and analyzing <laughs> how many coins have been lost? Right. I mean, uh, realistically yeah. speaking, what three million coins? So there are in total circulation. Right now, I don't know, 17, 18 million coins up to now mined? Yes, yes. I think, I think we're 18, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, I think Bitcoin Tina is great for talking about stuff like this. Um, I don't know if you've heard some of his stuff, but um, I mean, he talked about this idea of it has such potential to get crazy because we've never seen something truly scarce before. And you know, there is a real potential for the sellers to turn into buyers. And then you have a buyer's buyer's market where it's just this mad grab for it. And it happens just in a a few months or something like that. I mean, it's really unprecedented. I think that, and I think, I I guess this is more of a question for you, but, you know, we see this as inevitable. I know that smart money, okay, so in my opinion, smart money is inevitably going to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Governments are inevitably going to figure this out. So really, is our role accelerating that process or is our role in trying to help as many, you know, everyday average people get on board before that happens? That's what I'm saying. I mean, even if it just means holding on to, 
a, really just a handful of satoshis would it be a thousand satoshis i mean it's it's really ridiculous but i would be the first one to 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 really seriously to donate if there was a campaign going on i would say hey you know what i don't have much other people like that are sitting on billions worth of 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 bitcoin you know good for them but yeah. if i was these people i mean i would seriously i would start a com campaign and say you know what every human being of all these eight billion people on this planet should have right now just this store of value not this you know not for purchasing things not for buying not for exchange nothing just sit on it hold like like a chicken on an egg <laughs> just hold, sit on it and and just wait what happens and the critical mass will be triggered much sooner than expected yeah i i think that there's so many crazy things that could happen especially um once you start talking about the idea that you could take a, you know, because they're infinitely divisible, and let's say we reach that monetization status, um, you know, we were talking, I was talking to um, Dan about this, and we were like, if Satoshi has this massive amount of uh, Bitcoin, you know, he's still somehow alive and holding on to it. Um, let's say Bitcoin becomes monetized and then like in a final gesture, you like, Oh my God, that's Bitcoin. exactly what, you know, what I'm trying to ask you now the whole time. And now, now you're saying it yourself. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> I've been having this thought like, why in the hell, if I were Satoshi, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, if I had a vision, this ethos, what would I do with this hell of 1 million Bitcoins? I mean, what is it good for then? Uh, is yeah, it exactly it like this like about? final seeding uh, event basically like yeah. the final monetization event where um i don't really know i don't know how it would work i mean i guess it would pro it would have to happen over lightning because at that point the transaction fees of spinning all that to tons of different outputs would be impossible um but yeah some sort of like grand dispersal of bitcoin in a is way that, that technologically possible? I don't know because um, I mean we're both not not really. I mean, is it could it be possible that let's say we we already let's say just hypothetically everybody on this planet, every human being has a public address. Uh, I mean, but you know right. it's stupid, but it's sort of naive thinking because each person also has like I don't know how many public addresses. So could it be like just evenly distributed around the globe? <laughs> around the globe? Uh, it could, it could, I mean, I don't know. It, it would have to happen on like a layer two or layer three. It wouldn't happen on a layer one, obviously, mm -hmm. because, you know, eventually the layer, the, the base layer is going to get to be where just a transaction is thousands of dollars. Um, and that almost all the Bitcoin will be used on, you know, lightning or other second layer things, side chains, stuff like that. Um, and the idea of someone like spoofing it and getting lots of addresses, I don't know. But I, you could imagine, like, I don't think it's that, it's a, it's a fun thought experiment. I think it's crazy a little bit, but it's also exciting and it's not impossible necessarily. I mean, you know, what we thought was possible with Bitcoin just a few years ago, Lightning has just blown that away. I mean, Lightning is really an incredible technology. Yeah. And um, I think that what Blockstream is doing with Liquid is really cool. I Amazing. just saw a presentation on that. And, yeah. you know, I didn't think about this, but you can have, because Liquid is using a form of elements that is, it's largely the same as Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, the way that it's constructed, then you can have things like Lightning Network also work on Liquid. So you can have a Liquid Lightning Network and then, you know, you could imagine there's interoperability between the Lightning Networks, between the classic Bitcoin chain and like the side chains. Um, you know, the scaffolding and infrastructure that's going to be possible is really just hard to even imagine. Yeah. Um, so who knows what's possible? It'd be a really cool final flourish um, after Satoshi's true vision is complete. <laughs> uh, what a genius. Like, Seriously. Oh my gosh, it's crazy to think. By that time, one Bitcoin is, you know, it doesn't matter you know, because I always say, you know, in, in the end of the day, sometime in the future, we're not going to think about how much euro a dollar is a Bitcoin worth, you know, how much purchasing power has one Satoshi's. I mean, can I go into Starbucks with one Satoshi's and buy a coffee then? 
does that mean that's like a super accelerated, you know, uh, you know, that that's called really purchasing power then, you know, I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe we need to break this down in that kind of language and uh, community, yeah, it, you know, you know, that's, that's something that was difficult. Um, and this is kind of going back to my article on intrinsic value, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, it's difficult writing articles like that because Austrians, you know, we have a different vocabulary from the everyday economist or everyday average person. And so um, I got some criticism on the article because I used the word intrinsic value. And, you know, the problem is that the everyday person uses the word intrinsic value and thinks that it means something. Mm -hmm. um, in the Austrian sense, it means nothing because value is subjective, right? <laughs> and so I was like trying to... Uh, it, I was trying to write to the person that doesn't know anything about Austrian economics and convince them of intrinsic value being a bad thing when really what they, they mean by intrinsic value is they mean commodity use. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, that intrinsic, like anything's intrinsic, you know, this cup I have, is, it has intrinsic value because, you know, it has memories to me that are intrinsic to the cup or something. I mean, it's all subjective, mm -hmm. but uh, for the lay person that doesn't really come through. And then the Austrians, like the super hardcore Austrians are like, no, Connor, why did you write that article? Like has the word intrinsic in it. You're talking about value. Like it's not subjective. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's a difficulty because, you know, we have to, it goes back to how do we, you know, talk to people about this and you, you have to meet them in the middle in a way, you know, yeah. you have to really think about what are the key philosophical tenets that you think, are important even from like you know someone that i really disagree with like someone who's a socialist or communist like you have to think about how do you play the game to make them believe the bitcoin's a good thing even if you don't agree with what they believe in uh, on on like a, a social level you know mm -hmm. um and you can think about interesting uh, interesting ways to articulate it you know um that bitcoin is about you know, voluntary action and consent and about um, financial equality in a way, you know, I mean, you can use all sorts of those words that people like um, that might not necessarily um, be in line with the philosophy of um, Austrian economics or, um, you know, libertarianism that I subscribe to. But I know that I can, you know, use some of these interesting formulations of explaining bitcoin to make it appeal to people of so many different walks of life so i think that's something good to be thinking about as well no yeah i think you did a great job in in really logical balanced reasoning i think you found really the the, the middle path you know the, to, to great article yeah people should read it uh so let's wrap wrap this up um uh connor but just final question out of the blue again going back to my original question um do you see uh because you know there's so many genius people out there with you know genius brains they have, whether they be innovators scientists engineers together with entrepreneurs do you see you know i'm going always i love this um this question because you know, we've been having like burning fuels, combustion engines for what, 150 years. Um, don't you find it funny or peculiar that we are still on burning fuels? Like with it be <laughs> rockets, missiles, SpaceX, Elon Musk, you know, it doesn't matter how advanced, but at the end of the day, we're still burning fuels when it comes to transportation or, you know, going into space. Uh, you know where I'm heading into, but do you think this is going to be disclosed or some or it's the system is going to be so decentralized that all these patents are going to be like released or or people that have this you know real real technological innovations and ideas developed and implemented gonna go out into the mainstream you know finally finding its way to us humanity serving humanity with this technology well, I think that you've touched on something really important about Bitcoin, and, and that's its open source nature. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, we're seeing technology that it recognizes that it is improved by being very open. You know, like it's, it's the idea that Wikipedia destroyed any private company's encyclopedia yeah. because it was an open source encyclopedia. And I think that 
and even Microsoft is moving in this direction towards open source technology. And what is the potential for human flourishing and the speed at which we can develop technological improvements if we're, op if we're operating an open source model? Yeah. I mean, so that I would be compensation and protection of the people who are bringing or, or developing together with the whatever investors, entrepreneurs, engineers, scientists, you know, like how do we compensate the people, you know, and protect them at the same time? Yeah, um, I think that that's, it's a difficult thing. Um, I think that every company that open sources will benefit from open sourcing. And so it's, it's in their own benefit. It's, it's in their own self interest to open source. Um, I think that, I, I think that you're touching on, on, on really the key point, which is that at first glance, it seems intuitive to operate in the same way that academia does. You know, it's closed, you only publish it, and then it's done, and it's tied to your name only, and that that's important for accumulating knowledge. You know, this sort of academic model we have, you operate in a small silo, which is a small group of peer reviewers, and then you publish this finished product. I think that we're moving away from that towards an open source model where anyone can publish anything they want, that anyone can build on anything they want, that nothing is ever finished, that there is no author. Um, and I think that as companies move towards this and how they build their own software, um, I think it'll benefit everyone and it will be in the self-interest of the companies to do it. So, um, uh, it, it is really the open source model is really the best way for for accumulating or producing or improving on human knowledge that we've seen. It, it just naturally flows in the same way that you know when people would pass down tales, you know, of a story in in like a family history, you know, or like tribes would would tell a tale and then it like slowly evolves over time and you get this really nice story at the end, right? Um, through generations, you know, it's really going back to that essential thing that the story is never complete. The software is never complete and we just keep building and building on top of it. Um, and I think that that is the natural way that human knowledge improves instead of you tell the story one time and the story is finished and it was written by this guy in the end. Um, so I hope we continue to move towards that. I think Bitcoin is a big step in that direction and, and sort of opening people up to this idea of open source and showing its potential. Um, yeah, I think, I, I think it's hard to even really know what that world will look like. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's so much potential there. It's, it's so exciting. Beautiful, beautiful final thoughts. Um, whenever you come to Vienna, Austria, let's, let's meet together. I'll, yes. I'll treat you for dinner and, and a glass of beer or red of red wine or whatever you want to have. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, just, just uh, it was really amazing talk with you, uh, Connor. And um, yeah, hope to have you back soon. On some well, thank you so much. No, I, I had a fantastic awesome. time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. And whenever you're uh, in the Bay Area, just let me know. And, yeah, okay, we'll Connor. Yeah. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Ciao. Thank you.